Hi, I'm a field application engineer at Enritsu Company. And today we are going to continue, this is the second part in our series, um, Vector Network Analyzer Fundamentals. Uh, we're gonna continue the, with the second part of, of the fundamentals webinar. Uh, those of you that attended uh, last week, we covered uh, the reasons why users need VNAs, some of the common VNA terminology, and we talked about the basic measurements. So primarily this was covering the reflection, transmission characteristics that we uh, use the VNA to measure and, and then compiling that information into a matrix that's known as the S-parameter matrix. So that was the basic measurements that we covered. Then we reviewed the system architecture of the VNA and highlighted some of the key components and some of the trade-offs in those key components to address the needs of the instrument and to get the highest possible performance and flexibility. Um, so for those of you who uh, missed last week, it is a recorded event. So um, I do encourage you to, to, uh, to attend that. Um, but today we're gonna move on and cover really the most important part of using the VNA, and that is how to calibrate it, because this goes beyond just instrument calibration that's done in a calibration lab. This is really what is incumbent on the user. The user needs to perform this calibration in order to get useful measurements out of the VNA instrument. We'll talk about VNA specifications. We'll talk about how those specifications, together with the calibration that we're going to perform, uh, contribute to the overall accuracy and uncertainty of the measurements. And then in the time remaining, we'll go over some of the advanced measurements beyond just the S parameters that we've been talking about last week and today. Um, we'll include some, some discussion on, on time domain, gain compression, IMD, some of the nonlinear measurements, as well as uh, balance differential, uh, which really require uh, four-port VNA. Up until now, we've been basically talking about uh, two port measurements of RF and microwave components. So we'll review some of those advanced measurements at the end, and I'll also have a short uh, demo as we did last week uh, to review some of the key concepts covered today. Um, so BNA calibration, what we need is standards. That's the most important thing. We need impedance standards. We need to be able to basically train the instrument on what is a perfect 50 ohm system and set the reference plane and um, and and calibrate with our through line and, and other other um, components that are required. Uh, we also have mechanical cal kits that have the standards, but in, in addition, we have an automatic calibrator as well that makes the job of calibration a lot easier because the standards are inside and they're switched. We'll review the types of calibrations because we'll look at both two port and other uh, calibration types that can be performed. And then we'll review the specific algorithms that are uh, required to uh, compute the calibration error coefficients, which are then applied to uh, correct the measurement for these various things uh, that are non-ideal about our setup. And uh, no instrument is perfect 50 ohms, no instrument uh, is, is going to have no insertion loss. So there's things that we're correcting for. And that is the whole purpose of the calibration is to make our system perfect so that we can make accurate measurements. So again, um, instrument calibration is what's done in a Cal lab. So this is where when you send your instrument to a service center, they produce a calibration certificate. Uh, in the case of the VNA, this process is pretty simple. It's just measuring the power uh, or adjusting the power. So in other words, a power calibration, um, checking the the frequency um, and adjusting that as required. But those are really pretty small compared to what is left for the user to do because without that, we cannot make accurate measurements with the VNA. So, so we wanna do the following when we're doing the um, uh, user calibration. We wanna establish a 50 ohm reference. We want all our measurements, obviously, in RF and microwave to be referenced to exact 50 ohms. So we, we want to establish that reference at both ports. Uh, and then we want to set where our reference plane is going to be for the measurement, because we don't want to include in the measurement everything else outside of the, the device under test. So we want to 
remove contribution due to cables. We want to remove contribution due to the fact that the instrument is not perfectly 50 ohms. Um, we want to correct for, for the fact that couplers that we talked about last week, the, the reflectometers are not perfect, that they have some leakage. So all of those things are treated in the user calibration or the measurement calibration. And as I said, we're going to use either a manual calibration kit with uh, a number of standards, open, short, load, typically standards in there, um, or we're going to use an automatic calibrator that pretty much does the job for us. We just have to hook it up and press go. Um, and then we apply the various algorithms to obtain those calibration coefficients that we use to then correct the raw measurement to a calibrated um, measurement. So we could use SOLT, that's the most common algorithm, but there are also other algorithms such as LRM and LRL that make use of different standards depending on the algorithm. And of course the AutoCal has its own complete uh, algorithm as well. So again, a, a VNA can't make accurate measurements unless we perform this user calibration. So it is fundamental to making accurate measurements. So you, as you can see in this diagram, we have the two VNA ports and the dashed uh, red line is where we actually want to reference our measurement to. We don't want to include everything outside of that red dashed line, which would be the cables and the instrument itself. Um, we want to just isolate our measurement to what's in between those two dashed lines. So we want to define our reference plane as zero dB, zero degrees phase, and remove all the systematic errors that are due to the instrument. So things like source and load match, directivity, isolation in the instrument, and also the frequency response uh, of the cables that are connecting to the device. All of that is going to get removed in this process, we, and we refer to those errors as systematic errors. Then in addition to that, there's a whole other class of errors that are random in nature and are not possible to be calibrated out, at least not completely. And those relate to connector repeatability, cable stability, changes in the environment can also cause drift and can enter error as well. So what we try to do here is control those factors as much as possible so as to, to minimize them um, and gain the most accurate measurement we can. So we need calibration standards, as I, as I pointed out. Uh, for the S-parameter measurements, typically they'll, they'll be either discrete standards in coax or waveguide. The CalKit is going to be selected based on the interface of the device you're testing. So it'll be a certain connector type or a waveguide type. And there will be included in that CalKit uh, a variety of standards, open, short, load, typically is what you'll, you'll have. Um, the AutoCal module, which is the next item there on the, on the right-hand side, um, has connectors on it, um, and internal to that box is all of the standards, and those are basically going to get switched um, through serial control of the AutoCal module from the VNA. So this is an automated calibration, makes it a lot easier to use. Just hook it up, and through the menus, you start the cal, and once it's done, It'll, it'll tell you it's done, and it'll, and it'll also do a, a short verification to confirm that it's, that it's good. Um, we also have other CalKits depending on the configuration of your device under test. So we have a, a, a microstrip CalKit that we typically use for, for connectorless measurements, so a device like a substrate, cer a ceramic substrate with, with circuit on it, on a, on a substrate that would fit into a fixture. So those uh, substrates are used to first calibrate the fixture before you test your device um, in the case of, of no coax connectors. And then wafer level measurements have their own uh, set of calibration substrates that are frequently used that also have the standards on them. And you just basically touch down on the standards during the calibration process and measure them. So those are all the calibration kits that could be used for standard S parameter transmission reflection measurements. But as I've been alluding to in, in these presentations, there's a lot more that today's modern VNAs can do. Uh, we can not only sweep frequency, but also sweep power. So if we're doing power type measurements, either um, uh, gain compression or intermodulation distortion or IMD measurements, uh, we need to have a power meter 
to actually calibrate our system because now instead of doing ratio measurements that we, as we've been talking about for S parameters, we're going to look at a, a non-ratioed measurement where we're strictly measuring power. So we need to have a power reference and, and the power meter provides that. So that's another tool used for calibration. And then finally, we have optoelectronic measurements that we're now able to do with the VNA because we have a reference uh, optical to electrical module that we use as a front end for the uh, microwave VNA. And that's fully calibrated or characterized magnitude and phase. And we can remove that in the process of measuring something else. So, um, so that serves also as a calibration tool uh, when we're doing these cross-domain optical to electrical measurements. The AutoCal module has, as I mentioned, uh, all of the standards internal, and there are switches. And then under control, serial control of the VNA, we switch the various standards to complete the calibration. The algorithm is, is different from SOLT because we're actually using more standards than are required to cover the frequency range of interest. So it's, it's somewhat of a redundant or an overdetermined calibration algorithm. So that provides some additional accuracy over the manual techniques because we're using a different algorithm entirely here. Uh, and then we have some through losses, through lines in there as well that are very low loss. Uh, and those are, are, are used as well to do the transmission uh, or the through calibration uh, portion of it. So the AutoCal simplifies very much the, the calibration process and, and is completely controlled by the VNA. Calibration types. Um, we need to have different, different types depending on what we're trying to do. The most complete calibration will always be the full two port cal, and that will be required if you're trying to measure all four S parameters. However, there are other simplified calibration types that can be used for just doing reflection, in other words, just a one port measurement, or a measurement in one direction. Uh, in this case, one path two port would cover uh, a transmission in one direction, and then the um, the reflection on both ports. So it depends on what is needed and how much time you want to spend on the calibration. But nothing will ever beat the full two-port calibration because it is the most complete and covers what's needed to measure all four S parameters. VNA calibration. Again, let's review the purpose. We're trying to reduce all the systematic errors for both ports, forward and reverse, everything that's non-ideal about the instrument as well as removing any contribution due to the cables that are connecting to the device. So for that, we recommend a full 12 term calibration. So we're gonna use one of the following techniques. We're gonna either use a short open load through, which is the most common calibration algorithm that's used, um, especially in the case of coax, but there are other algorithms depending on um, what you're measuring and what is the configuration because in some cases it may not be convenient to have SOLT. You may only have uh, lines that are basically perfect 50 ohm lines of various lengths to cover a certain bandwidth of interest with a reflex standard, or maybe you add a match, or um, in some cases you don't have an open, so you're gonna use an offset short technique, and this is in the case of a waveguide calibration. So there are some, some permutations to the algorithm that allow you to select the Cal standards that are, that are most optimized for the configuration. Then in addition to that, there's always going to be technique, care, knowledge, how you torque your connectors, how clean are the connectors. All these things can contribute to some of the random errors that I uh, described earlier. These can be controlled certainly, um, and they need to be watched obviously. As, as, as we're going higher in frequency, they become more and more important. Calibration algorithms. This is a, a more in-depth look at the different techniques uh, that we have. SOLT, as I said, is the most common, not always the most convenient because you have to have well-defined standards. And sometimes you don't have that depending on the configuration of, of what you're measuring. Um, offset short just simply removes the open and adds a second short with a, with a separate offset length. Same math as SOLT. It is a little bit band limited. Uh, as a result, typically used in banded waveguide applications. We can actually add a third offset short 
and eliminate the need for a, uh, a good termination, which is difficult at high frequencies. Uh, so this is another technique that's based on the same map, but utilizes different standards. And then we also have cases where we don't have a, a well-defined through. So we, we use what's referred to as a, as a reciprocal through in those cases. So that might be in, in some of the examples where you're going from one connector type to another, uh, but you still need a through line to do that. But you may not know the exact electrical definition for it. In other words, you don't have the loss or the, or the line uh, length information. LRL, TRL, this is a whole different algorithm and it makes use of, of lines of different lengths, uh, highly accurate, obviously, transmission lines, 50 ohms. This is common in on-wafer uh, scenarios. Um, and this is really one of the best calibrations for broadband, especially when we add the two reflex standards. So we have both the open and the, and the uh, short, um, but it does require the, the low definition. In some cases it calculates that, um, but it is a common technique that's used in, in wafer, wafer level calibration. So how does calibration work? work? Once I make all of the measurements of the known standards, um, we compare that to what that value should be. And it will not be that value since there are some good errors there. We're gonna calculate that difference vector. So that error coefficient is that vector that basically um, is the difference between the raw measurement we're making with the VNA uncalibrated and what is supposed to be the actual uh, performance of that standard. So that difference is the error. We store that error coefficient, magnitude and phase at every frequency and data point that we use in our calibration. And then it's applied when we make the measurement. So the VNA will continue to make a raw measurement. And then when the calibration is applied, we're correcting that raw measurement and making it accurate. So we compile what's known as the 12-term error correction model. So this is all of the error terms on both ports. If you do the full two-port calibration, you'll have 12 error terms that will describe all of the um, inaccuracy or the non-ideal nature of the, of the instrument and the cables connected to the device. So we're looking at transmission frequency response, both forward and reverse. We're looking at the reflection frequency response. So this is all gonna be part of how we calibrate out the cables, for instance, source match, load match is gonna deal with the fact that the ports are not perfectly 50 ohms on the VNA directivity is addressing the reflectometer that's internal to the instrument and the fact that it's not perfect. Um, and then isolation is frequently uh, omitted in with today's modern VNAs because isolation between the two ports has really been improved in with today's modern hardware. So oftentimes that one is not required uh, and does not contribute to the overall um, accuracy. So these are the systematic errors and these are reduced by the measurement calibration that we're gonna perform as a user. As I mentioned earlier, there are other errors that we cannot simply correct for. These are things we'll have to control, either through the environment, through the stability of our cables. So we wanna use good test port cables, that's definitely important. Uh, connector repeatability, because uh, we're always connecting and disconnecting things. So all of these are not predictable and therefore we cannot fully correct for them. And this is where the good measurement practice comes in, is using good techniques to reduce these random errors as much as possible. So let's look at the overall VNA accuracy and how that's derived. Um, we start with our instrument specifications and then we perform the calibration. And once we've done that, the, air, the uncertainties are gonna be determined by both the specifications of the instrument and how well we do our calibration. So let's start with system dynamic range. This is the key spec of any VNA. Um, and it is simply calculated as the difference between the maximum rated source power and the specific noise floor at that frequency. So we're gonna look at it in bands and we're gonna look at what's the maximum leveled source power as one end of the system dynamic range. And then we're gonna measure the noise floor. And we measure the noise floor at a very low IF bandwidth, typically 10 Hertz. 
and um, and basically look at what is the low end of our system dynamic range. And the difference becomes the spec that's in this table. Then we look at our corrected system performance. So this is after we've performed the calibration. So what's important here in this table, and these are all in, in VNA data sheets, um, in both the system dynamic range as well as the, the corrected system performance. What's important here um, is looking at what cal kit we're using, first of all, because every cal kit will perform differently. Uh, an auto cal may do better than a manual cal kit at times. So there are differences when you look at the corrected system performance. But again, we're looking at this, the, the terms in the 12-term model. So directivity, source match, load match, reflection and transmission tracking. And we're doing that on, at various frequency bands. And this performance is measured using the metrology grade air airline. This is how you verify how good is your calibration and, and derive your specs based on what cal kit you're using. And typically it's going to be a full two port um, 12 term calibration that's performed. So the measurement uncertainties are going to be the result of our VNA dynamic range That'll affect uncertainty, of course, but more importantly, it's what we just performed, which is the VNA calibration and correcting for that system performance. So the directivity, load match, source match, all of those things contribute along with the type of error correction we're applying. And then the quality of our Cal standard, certainly that contributes to it as well. So it will be very much calibration uh, kit dependent and algorithm dependent. And then ultimately the, the measurement is um, also, um, uh, accurate is also determined by the dynamic range of the VNA. And then we have the additional calibration stability and, and connector repeatability, which are part of the random errors. We do assign a factor to those and enter that into our uncertainty model. And then what is the DUT that we're measuring? Is it, is it low loss? Is it higher loss? All of that will also be factored in to determine what the exact uncertainty is uh, of the measurement. So we have on the Enritsu website some uncertainty software tools that allow you to generate the curves, which I'm showing you now in the next slide. Um, and these curves are going to be a function of uh, the calcut you're using, the algorithm that's being used as well, and the uh, loss of the device. If it's a, let's say it's a passive device, um, along the x-axis is going to be the uh, transmission for that device in dB, and then on the y-axis is your uncertainty. So we're looking at both the transmission magnitude as well as the transmission phase uncertainty and the reflection magnitude and phase. And again, all of this is determined based on what it is we're trying to measure. So you can see that the, it's, it's going to have a different level of uncertainty as we increase the loss of the device we're measuring because so we're getting closer to the noise floor. Um, and also reflection measurements start to uh, become more uncertain at higher, higher reflection coefficients. So that covers the calibration portion. Um, in the remaining time I have, I'll talk a bit about the advanced measurements that can be performed with today's modern VNAs. Uh, we'll talk about time domain, some of the nonlinear measurements such as gain compression, IMD, and then four port um, balance differential. Time domain is basically an inverse uh, fast Fourier transform of, of the frequency domain data. So we're using a, an, an inverse FFT algorithm to convert frequency domain data into time and by doing that, we're able to look at things like discontinuities in cables and connectors on the transmission line. And we can look at that as a function of either time or distance. So we can pinpoint exactly where we may be having some issues as far as uh, matching goes, or we have some discontinuities where we're getting large reflections. So we want to measure these devices in both frequency and time domain, because if we just look at them, at them in frequency, domain, we're, we're just going to see a large reflection or, or a, a return loss that approaches zero. Uh, so not very interesting. So we take that frequency domain data, do an inverse FFT, and now all of a sudden we get additional insight on what's going on um, along the length of that device that's actually contributing that 
that uh, return loss uh, frequency domain plot that you see above. So the time domain exposes a lot more uh, useful information that is not seen in frequency domain. And time domain resolution, because of the way the algorithm works, is going to be inversely related to the frequency bandwidth. And this is referring to the bandwidth of the instrument. So if you have a 40 gigahertz VNA, um, you're going to get a certain resolution. If you get have a 50 or a 70, you're going to get uh, a better or a narrower resolution. So the ability to actually um, distinguish different uh, or resolve different discontinuities is based on how much frequency bandwidth we have in the instrument. So obviously we get to 110 gigahertz, we improve the, uh, the resolution quite a bit. Another way to look at this information is through a TDR display, or something that looks like the TDR. Uh, we use low pass time domain to do that. So this requires a harmonic calibration where the start frequency uh, is equal to the step size. So that means that every frequency point in our sweep has to be harmonically related to the first point. And that's what defines a harmonic sweep. So a harmonic sweep is required to do low pass time domain processing. But when you do that, and you display the impedance plot, you can see much the same results that you would see on a TDR display. So TDR, of course, is a time domain instrument. So we're trying basically here to do the same thing. And by having more frequency bandwidth, in other words, having not only the high frequency data, which gives us the resolution, but also the low frequency data, which gives us additional accuracy uh, to uh, get better impedance measurements, we can resolve, in this case, the, what the impedance is on the line. And so this is a, a Beatty standard, which has 50 ohms at the beginning, then it switches to a different uh, 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 impedance, and then comes back to 50 ohms. And that's precisely what we're seeing on this TDR display, uh, is that 25 ohm section of the Beatty line. So that was for reflection. Uh, for transmission, uh, we're able to look at uh, what it's called the eye diagram. Basically, we're, we're converting frequency domain data, in other words, the S-parameter data, uh, again, through, a, through an algorithm at the time, and we're applying it in the transmission sense. So we can see an eye diagram, either NRZ or PAM4, uh, and look at our interconnects and characterize them, not only in frequency, but also through this algorithm, see what the impact is um, in time and see what the eye uh, closure looks like. Gain compression, here we're sweeping power as opposed to frequency. So the x-axis now becomes power, and the y-axis is going to be uh, an absolute power uh, measurement that we're making with our receivers. So we're going to sweep the power from some level to uh, some other level, and we're going to look at the linearity at the output side. And we can compare both the sweep on the input with the sweep on the output and where that output curve starts to compress by 1 dB, we're able to capture the gain compression point. So that's what the software in here does. It, it captures the, uh, the gain compression point. And we can do the same with phase. So we can actually look at AM and PM measurements uh, as a function of input power. So these are nonlinear measurements. Another topic is IMD, intermodulation distortion measurements, where we have the ability to generate two tones. If we have a dual source VNA, we're able to do that, combine them, and then inject those two tones into the device that we're testing and characterize its nonlinear properties. So what you'll get at the output will be the two fundamentals as displayed there, um, and the uh, third order products will be the next, and then there'll be the fifth and the seventh. So we're able to look at all of the higher order intermodulation products, but most importantly, it'd be the third order if we're trying to look at third order intercept points uh, of an of a active device. So, so here we're able to do something that a spectrum analyzer can do as well, but what's nice about the VNA is that it not only gives, gives you the spectrum analyzer uh, plot like the, is shown there with the two tones and the products, but we're able to sweep that over frequency and actually capture the behavior not only at one frequency, but across a whole band of, of frequencies. So this is an example of where 
uh, a spectrum analyzer can, or, or a VNA can actually do uh, a whole suite of different measurements from S parameters to nonlinear gain compression, IMD, uh, as well as harmonics, because the VNA can tune its receivers to whatever frequency is required to capture those products while the, the sources are applying the two-tone stimulus. So we're able to completely disconnect the receiver from the, from the source and independently tune them. And then the balanced differential applications are the ones that really require four-port VNA, and they become quite popular now, um, and it's mainly because of noise immunity. So differential signaling stands up better to, to, the, to the noise than single end it does. So we see a lot of different uh, amplifier, filter designs, transmission lines, interconnects that are moving towards um, differential interfaces. And again, the, the key benefit here is that while we have our differential signaling, which means one side is, is, is zero degrees and the other side is 180 degrees, the noise gets canceled out as, as a result. So we're able to get our signaling through while at the same time uh, canceling, canceling the noise. So when we're using a four port VNA to do this, we end up redefining the four port VNA with two single ended pairs and creating a, a new port one that's purely differential that's composed of single ended ports one and three and a new port two that's composed of single ended ports two and four. So this is how we're able to redefine a VNA that is normally single ended with four ports to a differential system that is, that is a two port system with 180 degrees out of phase, because that's what differential signaling is all about. <clears throat> so we define a whole nother set of S parameters. Of course, since we have four ports, instead of having four S parameters, we now have 16. So we have everything from S11 to S44. But we take that a step further by performing uh, what's known as superposition um, to redefine another set of S parameters for mix mode which will have everything from differential to common mode. And common mode is basically zero degrees phase difference. Differential is 180 degrees. And that's the, the, the mode that we want. And then we look at common mode rejection because there are gonna be cases where we apply differential, but some common mode is produced on the output side. So we're trying to suppress that. So we look at those parameters as well in our overall matrix. Uh, so some of the common differential measurements would be insertion loss, or if I'm looking at a backplane or, or a, a transmission line, um, I want to measure the differential loss from input to output. So the terminology changes slightly here. Before we had S21, now we define it at SD2D1, which means it's differential at the input side and differential at the output side. So we're looking at the loss here. Uh, could also be gain if it was an amplifier. Um, and then we have return loss that we're measuring at both the input side and the output side. So this is a lot like the S11 and S22 measurements we talked about earlier, but now in the differential sense. Um, and then we look at the balance or the common mode rejection between the, the differential and common modes. And so that will be a mixed mode um, S parameter that has differential input, but a, but a common mode on the port two side. And then there's crosstalk measurements, both near end and far end crosstalk measurements. So we're looking at different cross pairs here. Uh, these are single ended S parameters because we're simply measuring how much signal is coupled from one line to the other. And that's again, something that we're trying to control when we do our design. Um, time domain, line impedance. So this is the impedance profiling I, I showed earlier. Uh, this is also done here. Of course, now it'll be referenced to 100 ohms rather than 50 ohms because it's a differential system. So all of these measurements can be performed with a four port VNA. Now, how do we perform them? There's a couple of different ways. Most of the time, if, if something is passive or linearly active, uh, we don't require a second source to, to create a full differential drive. So instead we apply the signal to each port one at a time, we measure all the responses at the other ports, and then we take those results and combine them mathematically using superposition to generate what is then the new matrix with the, with the differential common mode and mixed mode quantities in there. But it does assume that that device is linear and it could be pure passive or linear active. 
but it needs to be linear. And in that case, we can just use a single source and get all of our information for the differential S parameters. But in some cases, you have a nonlinear active device, and for those specific cases, which is a small percentage, um, we need to be able to have a, a true differential stimulus applied at, at differential port one and also measured at differential port two. So in this case, we do need a second source and we need to be able to differentially control the phase of that second source so that we can apply a true um, differential um, signal to, to both ports. So this is the technique that's used for nonlinear active device. Fortunately, we can use the same cow kits, but there is some additional algorithm that's performed to maintain that that 180 degree phase is, is relationship is met at the uh, reference planes of interest. So it does require a few additional sweeps to, to basically synchronize that. All right, and then finally a summary. Um, again, the VNA is an instrument that provides extremely accurate characterization of RF and microwave devices, either at subsystem level or down at the, at the component level. For the S parameter case, we're measuring ratioed uh, quantities, so everything is being referenced to the incident signal, and we're taking ratios internal. We have four receivers in the VNA to do that. We provide magnitude and phase information, so it's a true vector vector measurement, and we have wide dynamic range, very linear receivers internal to the VNA to do that. We work with a lot of different environments or configurations, ranging from coax to uh, waveguide on wafer, optoelectronic. So there are different environments we have to adapt to, both with our measurement as well as the calibration techniques that we choose um, to calibrate our VNA. And that's really the subject of today was what are the calibration methods and how do we apply them and why are they so important? Um, and then there's some other post-processing techniques where we can do things like impedance transformation and um, embedding, de-embedding to remove, further remove items from our uh, measurement uh, of interest so we can adjust the measurement plane to, to optimize for the best accuracy of what we're trying to measure. And we have some additional information on our website that I invite you to look at, um, application notes as well as measurement guides. And there's a whole book known as uh, VNA Calibration that's also available that goes through a lot of the concepts uh, we talked about today. Uh, I'm going to remind you again of the VNA portfolio that Nanritsu has, everything from Economy, basic S parameter VNAs, uh, one port, two port. Um, some of these are field uh, portable, uh, part of our handheld family. We have mid range performance VNAs that go up to four ports and actually cover some waveguide band as well at E band. And then we have the Vector Star, which is our high performance VNA, uh, which we'll have additional sessions on um, in, in our VNA uh, seminar series. Um, and uh, we'll talk about more uh, more detailed applications in those. Uh, I'm going to refer you back to the, the demo that we did last week, uh, where we went through the basic um, displays of the VNA. Uh, today, I'm just going to show you uh, some of the calibration concepts uh, as well. Okay, last week we covered the channel and the trace menu, which is where you set up your instrument state. Very important to do that before you calibrate. Um, and then the trace menu, which covered how we're going to display and what, what we're going to measure first and how we're going to display and scale it. Uh, over here is the calibration menu. So that's basically the next place we go um, after we've set up our instrument the way we want it. And we go into the calibration menu and we're able to choose between manual and automatic calibration. So the automatic calibration case is very simple. Um, it's either gonna be one or two port. This is a two port, 110 gigahertz um, BNA system I'm showing you. Uh, but in the case of the manual, it can also be one and two ports. But then we can also do the basic calibrations uh, that are either transmission or reflection only, or one path, two port, where we're just looking at one direction. But in most cases, we, we're going to want to do a, a full two-port cal. And in there, we're able to uh, select what calibration we want to use. So all of our calibration algorithms are, are listed here. And we choose the one that's appropriate for the configuration that we're measuring. And then we can edit some of the specific uh, uh, details of our, our connector interface and, and what's the length of the through that we're using for our calibration. 
And then we basically go back and start to measure all of the devices. We have to measure every device that we're going to use uh, in our calibration on both ports. So port one and port two. Uh, this is a special broadband example here. So we're actually using a, a hybrid of an SOLT and a, and, a, and a triple offset short to get all the uh, necessary standards measured to cover a broadband frequency range up to 110 gigahertz. We also have the through here. So once we've measured all of the standards, at that point uh, we'll be done and that tile will turn on and then the VNA will contribute the error correction coefficients and start to apply those on the measurements that we're making. So then we'll get the green light down here uh, that shows that we are um, corrected and, and getting accurate measurements. And that's it. That is the end of the presentation. Um, now, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Arno. Um, we have a question that came in from James Linehan. Can the Vector Star A models use the AutoCal? The answer, James, is yes. Uh, the A model uh, has support for the basic AutoCal, both for 40 and, and 70 gigahertz versions that we have. Great. Um, I don't have any other questions. Is there any other questions that anyone would like to type in? Okay. If you have any additional questions, please feel free to contact me directly. My email is there. I'd be happy to happy to answer. Great. Thank you, Arno. And be, on behalf of Anritsu Company and our presenter, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of the day. Thank you for attending our webinar. Bye.